Well, welcome everyone. That's your official start time that this event is ready to go. Um, it is 6 p.m. I'll do um, a few more minutes or a minute to let some folks that are joining us just now, but I wanna thank you all for coming tonight for our evening with the Italian seller and our hosts, Julie Farriker and Ed White. Um, I'm Amy Datis. I'm the director of the Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement. I'm a class of 2004 graduate myself. So I'm excited to see you all here tonight. Um, some classmates of Julie and mine, um, sorority sisters, family friends, all of that. So I will um, stop talking. Everyone can go ahead and mute themselves for now. Um, and then we'll go ahead into the interactive session later. And Julie and Ed will tell you when you can take your mics off or turn them on. Um, so for now, I thank you all for coming and I'm gonna hand it over to the professionals and hope we all have a great <laughs> evening. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. We appreciate that. Um, so tonight, while we're waiting on everybody else to join us, if anybody else is going to join us, um, we figured we'd just start off with a little question and answer session um, from the last event that we had. So I'm sure people had thought about things afterwards and thought, well, maybe I might have a question or something like that. So we figured if you guys want to type in any questions, we can answer those for you now. Um, and while we wait for those questions, uh, I figured maybe, Julie, if you could go over the classifications of Italian wine for us. Perfect. All right. Good evening, everyone. Buonasera a tutti. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so excited to be discussing our Sicilian summer wines with you. So before we begin, I know in the first session I had discussed Italian wine classifications. So just a quick primer before we begin. There's not a pop quiz, I promise, you know teachers are off from school this summer, but I just want you to picture a pyramid. And when we think of a pyramid, at the top of the pyramid was the term DOC G, so denominazione origine uh, controllata e garantita. So the DOC G wines, they're wines that have very strict rules uh, according to the Italian government. So when we're thinking of our Chianti Classico, our Brunello di Montalcino, our Barberesco, our Baloro wines that are you know, more in the popular areas here in the United States, those are wines that have very strict standards. Their grapes are from certain areas, their wines are aged in certain ways. It's basically very rigid. Then when we go to the next part of the pyramid, so the middle, we have DOC wines. So DOC wines, Denominazione Origine and Controllata. I refer to it more as it's not a quality issue ever. It's more just the rules are more relaxed. So when we think of Armante Pucciano di Abruzzo, we think of some of our um, maybe regional wines that come from specific regions. It just means that, okay, well, we have a larger growing area. Maybe the aging is six months versus a Doc G wine that has an aging time of, you know, three or four years. It's just more relaxed. And then wines that we're looking at tonight. So if you have your bottles in front of you, they're called IGT wines. So that's the third part of the pyramid. And that just means, and you could see it on the label actually, it has, so Alcesti is our producer. It is, um, this is a family owned winery on the island of Sicily, the largest island in the Mediterranean. And it has our, I'm looking at the Zabibo specifically. So the 2019, that meant the grapes, the Zabibo grapes were harvested in 2019, but it says Terra Siciliane Indicazione Geografica Tipica which are IGT wines. And that just means why it says Terra Siciliane. It means it's the land of Sicily. So it's the Sicilian area. And it's just a very, if I had that map in front of me, it's a very broad part of Sicily that those Zabibo grapes could be harvested. And so for the Alcesti, for the Zabibo wine, it just meant that they chose those grapes from that designated area, which basically is almost the whole island. And then for our Frappato as well, if you have your Frappato wine in front of you, it says 2018. Again, that just meant that the, this was the year the grapes were harvested. And it says again, Terra Siciliane Indicazione Geografica Tipica, which just means that the Frappato grape for this wine were um, harvested in from you know, an area on the island, which for Sicily means the whole island. So it's the same thing. So that's just something to keep in mind that when you see Italian wine tonight, or in the future, those are the three main levels. And it doesn't mean quality issues at all. It's just more the, the rules on how the wines were produced. And so that's 
our Italian wine system. Awesome. Did anybody else have any questions? The presentation's up on my screen, so I can't see if anybody typed anything, unfortunately. I'm looking at the chat box right now. I don't see anything in the chat box unless I'm missing anything. Okay, well, I say let's go ahead and, and start our little event tonight. So like we said before, this is the, um, this is the second part of our series. Um, if we look back at our little chart from before, we've done our introduction to Italian wine. This is where you guys get to relax a little bit and open up a bottle. Um, hopefully, if you guys didn't find um, or didn't weren't able to receive our wine, you found some wine to try tonight. Um, so go on and pour yourself a glass. We're going to get to the tasting notes and stuff like that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but you know, for right now, enjoy a glass, enjoy the smells, and we're going to teach you guys a couple different things about Italian wine. Um, you know, this right here, this is the Sicilian summer so this was our packages and stuff like that we had before you guys all saw this and um we have our maps so julie loves her maps we talk about it all the time um if she could live in a world of maps she would live in a world of maps um so tell us a little bit about sicily okay good evening yes it's very true i'm an english teacher and also a history teacher so i'm obsessed with maps i've been obsessed with maps since i was a child but of course the maps of italy of course, you see me wearing my Italian flag tonight for the Azzurri soccer team that won. I had just returned from Italy as well, so I'm still on Italian time as I talk about these maps tonight. But Sicily is the largest island in the Mediterranean. And so if we look at the map on the left, that's showing the Italian peninsula. And when we think of the Italian peninsula, we're thinking of our major cities of Milano in the north. That is our economic and you know, basically industrial capital of Italy. Then, of course, we can't forget about Rome. So Roma is in central Italy in the uh, region of Lazio. I had the, the fortune of being in Rome uh, when it was basically empty of tourists. It was uh, because I had just returned the other day. And it's still surreal to me that I was at the Trevi Fountain. I was at the Colosseum. I was at these monuments that usually are packed with tourists. And they were virtually empty. And it was an experience that I don't think I'll ever be able to replicate in my lifetime. So, but Rome is the capital, administrative capital of Italy. It is, you know, the, when we think of Italy, we think of Rome. And then the next largest city, if we go to the region right before, um, under Lazio, we have the city of Napoli. And Napoli is one of, is actually the densest city in the country. It's home to about 4 million residents. And Mount Vesuvius is always looming over that Neapolitan um, population. So that's the peninsula. But if we go to the tip of, they call it the boot, you know, roots in the boot. But if we go to the tip of the boot, which is the toe, then we have our island here to the left. This is Sicilia. So I'm using the Italian term. Usually we know it as Sicily. And Sicily has two major cities. So when we think of the city of the one that garners more attention, it's usually Palermo to the west. And then the city on the eastern side is Catania. And Catania is very similar with its Baroque churches, with its pristine beaches that are nearby, but it's also more associated with Mount Etna. Italy was full of volcanoes. It still has uh, major volcanic areas on the mainland and on the island of Sicily. And then we have volcanoes that are still active off the island. Of Sicily as well. So Italy is very much well known for its volcanoes. The reason why I mention that is because these volcanoes also contribute to the soils and contribute to our wines. But tonight we're focusing more on the western side of the island. So if Ed, you could just go back to the western side, is that the Alcesti winery. They're located on western Sicily. And western Sicily is known also for more white wines. We have white grapes that come from that area. What's interesting is that our Frappato wine tonight, Frappato's traditional home is actually the southeastern part of the island. But again, Alcesti wanted to um, produce wines made from native grapes that are, that are native Sicilian grapes, which is why they had opted to um, grow successfully uh, Frappato grapes. So that's our Sicily. Definitely. So I know you guys also received, you should have received a little packet. Um, hopefully you guys have taken a look through that. We're gonna answer some questions for you a little bit later. 
Um, but actually, Julie has has a favorite food, and those are rice balls from Sicily. <laughs> I and yes. my best friends did not know this until last year, um, and I got it a big surprise, ironically. But um, yeah, tell us a little bit about the food. What do you think about the food of, of Sicily? So if anyone here has Italian ancestry, especially in the United States, you know, one of the large ethnic groups are would be composed of Italians. And we, again, if you notice, on Sunday, we had the Euro Cup win that communities in Brooklyn, which is has the largest population of Italians outside of Italy, even Toronto, Montreal, parts of Massachusetts, parts of uh, Pennsylvania, those areas celebrated that win. As, and of course, we'll find many of those foods. But when we're talking Italian American foods, they were foods that are actually more influenced by Southern Italy because most immigrants had come to the United States from either Napoli, so the Neapolitan foods such as our spaghetti with the tomatoes, with pomodori, so spaghetti. And then we're looking at a picture, if you see on the right-hand side, they're called arancini, which are the rice balls. And the rice balls are very popular. Um, you know, I have New York roots, so I remember eating you know, rice balls since I was a kid. But that is a Sicilian cuisine that, of course, in New York then was morphed into a more of a New York type of cuisine. But other ones would include our favorite, the cannoli. Now, I'm saying the cannoli, but technically it's one cannolo, multiple cannoli. So if you're a cannolo fan, that's Sicilian. Uh, many dishes that have an eggplant base to them, that's Sicilian. So we included a recipe this evening that is a Catanese caponata. And it's a type of, I guess you could call it some type of an appetizer made up of um, eggplant. However, depending on where you are on the island, this appetizer dish would change. And usually if we had like a nice, you know, I'm just thinking back to all the carbs that I ate over almost three weeks. But if we had a nice piece of Italian bread, you know, the caponata would be a perfect um, accompaniment to that. Or you could just eat it, you know, on its own. But that's Sicilian cuisine. We're dealing with, you know, the, and then if we're dealing with the spaghetti, because of course we're not, you know, forgetting pasta dishes, but the pasta dishes are more going to be eggplant based as well. We're going to have spicier sauces because Sicily, the main thing to remember is that as an island in the Mediterranean, it had so many different cultures make its way through Sicily. We had the Phoenicians, we had the Greeks, we had the Moors, and all of those cultures combined to what is, you know, Sicily. That's why it's so different from the mainland. And many times Sicilians tend to be more regional. They tend to say, I'm Sicilian before saying I'm Italian. And it's because it has a unique identity that, you know, and it has its own uh, language, Siciliano, that is still spoken. And it's something that should be preserved. So Sicilian culture is still alive and well. And you know that's why tonight these two wines are very special to the Sicilian culture. And I think that, I mean, to, to me, they're pretty special to me as well because I like to say that my favorite word when describing a wine is whether it's versatile or not. Um, right. And Julie tends to, to find that amusing just about every time I say it. But <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is that the two wines that we have tonight I genuinely believe you could have these two bottles of wine at a dinner party and you could go through an entire meal, multi-course meal, without having to open different bottles of wine or feeling like you're going to have to spend a lot of money because they are very flavorful, but they're not so complex that they have right. to have this specific pairing for them. Um, so that's, you know, that's one thing that I, you know, I hope you guys, um, you know, figure out about these wines tonight because, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's always good to have something in your back pocket that you can just open up if you have friends or family come over um, that will, you know, that you know they'll enjoy, that you know you have a little bit of a story behind, you know, and that's, that's our goal for these events is to give you guys the information because it's always nice. It makes things taste better when you have a story to go with them, you know? So, um, but yeah, I figured we could go on and um, what we're gonna do is, oh, sampling notes. Um, so just real quickly, guys, again, you know, if you're not a wine drinker, if you don't drink a lot of wine, if you, you know, are kind of nervous about tasting different things, one of the things that we always recommend is to start small. So start with one of these categories. 
Um, you know, and, and as you grow and drink more wines and find more things that you like, you'll be able to find different ways to communicate what you like as far as maybe the smell or the color. Um, when you go to a restaurant or to a friend's house, you know, I really like those ruby red wines um, that, that are long on the palate. I really enjoy those, you know, those soft white wines that, you know, have the, the fresh tastes of lemons and are not too sweet. You know, these are the things that we want to be able to describe to other people. So that way we can go ahead and, 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 and you know, try to tell them what kind of wines we like without everybody having to have the same bottles of wine. Um, and again, you know, like we said last time, things could be different for everyone. You know, I like the colors of wine and the, and the taste. Um, you know, somebody else might prefer talking about the smells and the aromas in the wine. Um, or, you know, whether they're, they're, they're very minerally or not. Um, so like I said, just take one little thing away from this and I think everybody should be happy. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up the mics. Um, here is the map again. Again, this is the part of Sicily that we're gonna be talking about tonight. This is where the vineyard is that um, your wines have come from. And the first wine we're gonna try is a Zabibo. So if you are muted, Amy, can you help us unmute everybody that we manually muted? Everyone should be able to. Yeah, go ahead and unmute. Awesome. So Julie, just refresh us a little bit about the Zabibo grape. Okay, so again, when I talked about Sicily as being one of the most culturally diverse islands and especially in Sicilian history, the Zabibo grape embodies this concept because it's not only a dry wine grape, at one point it was considered a table grape. And then because it was actually a grape that migrated from Egypt to Sicily, because we had the Phoenicians who had brought it to Sicily, it was a raisin grape at one point. So Zabibo really is, I call it like a grape with a triple attitude, because it is, to use Ed's word, versatile, <laughs> because depending on the type of wine you're drinking, Zabibo fits it. So if we were not in Sicily, the grape would be referred to as Moscato di Alessandria, or Muscat di, you know, Alexandria, you know, going back to its Egyptian roots. And it's a grape that has, it's very aromatic, as you can tell when, if you're trying to, you know, maybe sniff your wine so far. And it's one of the few aromatic grapes, you know, we're thinking of Gewurztraminer, we're thinking of Sauvignon Blanc, we're thinking of Riesling. It's very similar to that, but this is a Sicilian grape uh, now. You know, it's funny with Italian grapes, as I've been studying them, the ones that the Italian seller tries to focus on are usually considered native grapes. However, not these, if we're really being for purists about the term native grape, we, the, the list would go from 600 to probably 10 because these grapes mm. at some point have migrated. So for example, this was a grape that had migrated to Sicily and then had acclimated itself to the terroir. So when, I, when Ed had shown the Western part of the Sicilian island, this grape, when we're talking about another form of it, which is a, more of a sweetened um, Zabibo, there's actually an island off the coast of Sicily that's even closer to Tunisia than it is to Sicily, which even helps, you know, the history part makes it even more complex. But that grape, when it's grown there, it's considered a UNESCO protected wine because of the way that it's grown, the conditions. So Zabibo is very important to Sicilian history. And in the United States, it's probably not as well known. It's considered sconosciuti, which is, means unknown, but that's our goal here is to just introduce people, especially if you, know, if you have Sicilian heritage, it's very, very uh, possible that your ancestors were, might've enjoyed this wine. Because as I said, it is a dry wine. It's been a, considered a dessert wine. It's been considered even a table grape. So, and the term itself, Zabibo, it actually came from Arabic of the term Zabib, which meant raisin. So let's try this wine, shall we? Definitely. So just to remind you guys, you know, I think we talked about it last time, if you guys were in the last event, if you have a piece of white paper or white tablecloth or something like that, when you're looking at the color of wine to be able to describe it at first, you know, holding it up against the wall, clearly I've got green and blue monkeys on the wall, so it's going to have a darker tint. <laughs> 
But if you hold a piece of white paper behind it, you can actually if have the light hit it the right way. You can see the color. So what color does everybody see? We gave you a cheat sheet, but somebody might see something a little bit different. Yellow straw sounds about right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the straw I yellow see. sounds about right. <laughs> I see Danielle studying the wine. <laughs> So yeah, so you know, I usually swirl it just a little bit so that way I can you can really smell the smells, and then I'll compare that to the taste that I that I that I taste after I taste it. So I'll smell it and then I'll taste it. So remember, this is considered an aromatic grape. So you know the intensity compared to maybe uh, another white wine that we might have could be a little different. Mm. So what do you guys think? What do you what do you what are you smelling versus what you're tasting? I can tell you one of the you know Julie one of the main things for me when I'm actually tasting it I actually taste a little bit of honey like raw fresh honey um, which is not something that I smell when I smell it so um, you know the, the the fresh lemon I definitely smell the citrus. I smell the fresh apple. Um, it's a little bit mineral, minerally when I smell it, but it's much less, it's much more fresh when I taste it. Yes. So the mineral aspect gives us even more of a clue. So even if I hadn't told you, this is from Western Sicily, you know, the Alcesti, the producer, right. when we're dealing with Sicilian wines, if we have that type of mineral, you know, to aroma to it, that tells us that this is close, that the winery itself is closer to the coast. Okay. So, and then that's, you know, so closer to the coast and away from the volcano, right? Yes. Yeah. Because we're yeah. on the Western side of Italy. Right. And, and it would definitely have a different taste Basically. if it was, mm -hmm. if it was closer to the volcano, just because of oh, the yes. lime and the rocks and everything else. Yeah. So what do you guys think of this wine? Um, well, it, Amy and Tim from Florida, but uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to join in. Um, I, I got it. I don't taste any dryness, and I think it's extremely fresh. And just like you said, with the flavors, and I don't taste. And I guess maybe they say it's dry, but it's, it's delicious. I, I, yeah, I think it's. I think it's absolutely delicious. It's fresh. You can eat it. You can drink it with absolutely anything. You know, I mean, you could look at fish, or you could look at you know, chicken or maybe even pork. Um, I, I think it's a little bit dangerous because I could definitely see myself and I have seen myself open more than one bottle uh, on an ass Sunday afternoon um, when I'm getting ready for the work week and messing around my house, but. So what do you mean by a great uh, longevity? Where does that phrase uh, really uh, reflect? Sorry. Oh, so I, I Professor Altman. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I was Professor. just asking about the phrase longevity. What does that What does that really mean in terms of this wine or any wine? Well, yeah. Did you? you yeah. You can take it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So longevity is more on the palate. So when I am to okay, so I'm going to sip the wine, and the longevity is especially with the Zabibo grape because of the type of flavors that are involved, that this is a wine that lingers. So that's the longevity of that. Sometimes we might taste a wine that after a few seconds, we'll either judge its acidity or if it's a red wine, it's tonicity and then move on. But I'm still, so this is maybe 10 seconds later, I'm still able to enjoy this wine. I still have some of the flavors of this wine in my mouth. Mm. And again, with this grape, as I mentioned earlier, because it's very versatile aspects and the, the, the role that this grape plays, it's not surprising that this is one that has great longevity because it's you know aromatic, it's, it has fresh acidity to it, it has the flavors that would allow for this. So that's really more um, just anything that, when, when that stays with you later. What other questions do you guys have? That was a good one. Does everybody enjoy this one? I, I'm enjoying it. Thank, thank you for hosting this too, guys. This is great. I was wondering, I really enjoy drinking like out of just a small glass, not like a, a big, so I, does that affect 
anything I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming like if my hands are warming it, that's probably not good. So like maybe not handling the glass as much or is it, or does it not matter at all? Well, I mean, so the, the temperature of the wine is definitely going to be important regardless of, of what you're doing. You know, we want it to stay cooler if it's supposed to be served cooler. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, I enjoy a glass, like a, just a cup, like you're, you're, you know, you're talking about right there. Um, typically, I don't drink out of, you know, stemmed glasses unless I'm in a restaurant or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have a, just a heavy, you know, heavy water glass. Um, and, and that's just a preference right there. You know, clearly if you're going to drink more, you know, more aged wines or something that, you know, you, you really want to smell the intense flavors of and stuff like that, you're not going to be able to swirl it as much. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, too. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not against it. So Julie might have a different opinion. <laughs> <laughs> no, Danielle, you can use whatever you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I do have heritage from Palermo too, which is cool too. So, awesome. yes, yes, Danielle and I have spoken a lot about Italian heritage before, and you and she's from Philadelphia. Yeah. So you know, a lot nice. of Italian Americans in that area as well. Yeah, for sure. Okay, guys. Any other questions about this particular wine? Maybe. How about Ed's? Really, he's the master of pairing wines. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So Ed, carte blanche. What would be your ideal dish with this? The ideal dish that I would make or the ideal dish that I would go out to a restaurant and grab right now for it? How about both? Okay, so I really think, I mean, right now it's summertime, it's hot here in Virginia. I know it's hot there in Florida, for those of you who are in Florida. Um, if I were to go out to a restaurant, maybe a fresh grilled chicken salad um, with like a balsamic vinaigrette or something like that, I think that would be absolutely perfect for it. Um, if I was, you know, at home tonight, what I'm going to make is um, fish. Is I'm going to I'm, I'm going to bake some fish. So I'm actually going to do like some salmon with a honey glaze, um, and just some fresh vegetables. Um, so that's that's what I'm going to do a little bit later. Um, but that's me. That's that's kind of my go-to dish as well. Um, this one is good. The Zabibo is really good for cooking if your recipe calls for a white wine. Um, the flavors in it, you know, the fact that it is light and you know, when Julie was talking a little bit earlier about, you know, that long finish, uh, the longevity and the structure of the wine, um, that helps when you're talking about actually cooking with the wine. So if you have like a pasta sauce that you're going to, you know, make like a lemon pasta sauce or something like that, or toss some pasta in wine, this would be perfect for that. So that is my carte blanche. <laughs> okay. I agree with whatever Ed says for pairings with pairings <laughs> okay so let's go back again with the map we're talking about this part of sicily right here and we're going to move on to the red wine clearly you don't have to down your white wine mm -hmm. um let's talk about the frappato a little bit so tell us about the grape julie so frappato is one of the up-and-coming sicilian grapes because again, you know, Sicilian wines usually were associated with, if you've ever, you know, maybe read a little bit about Italian wines, the, the grape Nero d'Abola, which is a darker, fuller bodied red wine. Well, Frappato is its cousin. And the Frappato grape is usually blended with Nero d'Abola to make a wine that's a little more, not as tannic, maybe a little more pleasant to the palate, especially in the summer because of course, uh, fuller bodied wines in the summer sometimes are a little too much for Sicilian heat. Trust me, the, the temperatures in Italy were very warm. I always compare it to Florida in the summer without as much air conditioning. So I can't imagine people drinking these fuller bodied, powerful wines. So Frappato is more that summer wine. Now, this, the producer is Western Sicily. However, the, the traditional home of Frappato because of uh, the, the soils that it usually likes more, the red soil, clay calcareous soils on the Southeastern side. But as I mentioned, Alcesti wanted to, you know, stick with the main native grapes of Sicily. So they were able to have great success with this, but it's usually seen as a blender with the Nero d'Avola grape, but Alcesti and some other producers are starting to make mono varietal versions of it. And I, I think it's great. You know, I always, the color, 
you can see, so, you know, ideally one time we would have a Frappato wine next to a Nero Davila wine. So you could see how Frappato, you know, when blended with Nero Davila helps soften the wine itself and soften the color, but it's the term Frappato. It, because when, if we were to look on the, at the grapes, you know, in the vineyard, they were very tightly packed clustered grapes. And that's why you, uh, a winemaker could tell the difference between Frappato grapes and Nero Davila grapes because Nero Davila on the vine is usually more loosely packed. So that's just another little tidbit if we were in a contest trying to figure out which grape is which. Well, I like the contests. So, <laughs> okay, so hopefully you guys, if you open up your red wine, go ahead and look at the color and let us know what you think about the color. Again, look at it, at it against something lighter. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Cheers. Saluti. Did there we go. Mm. Do you taste tobacco? How do you know what tobacco tastes like? I don't eat tobacco. <laughs> All right, now that. Okay, so what do you guys think? Does I love the color. I tend to compare colors sometimes to future lipstick colors. Okay. It's a beautiful one. <laughs> what about you guys? What do you, what do you think about the smells? Can anybody smell anything different than what they're tasting? Spicy. I heard somebody say spicy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it is kind of it's kind of strange because it does it smells spicy, but when you taste it, you're kind of expecting something to taste a little bit more spicy than than what it actually is. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, you can you taste more of the fruity side of everything when you taste it, but then when you smell it, it's just it's it's absolutely a hundred percent different. It's you know, it seems like it's gonna be heavy wine. It's very, very deceitful. And what's interesting is that I've been reading that they're trying to introduce this Frappato monovarietal wine as one that would be perfect at Thanksgiving. Mm. Because if you think about turkey, especially cranberries, the stuffing, your dressing, that this would be that- sleep and a nap with a glass in your hand. <laughs> trying not to because, everywhere. Right, because think about a narrow dabla, because I keep going back to that because that's what it's usually compared to. Right. That would be a little too much for yeah. a turkey deal, for mm -hmm. a turkey meal. Whereas this would be, you know, a little bit better. So, you know, who knows? Maybe the Italians will not only take over Eurovision and soccer; they'll also take over American Thanksgivings with an Italian wine at the at the table. And the other thing too is, if you guys haven't had a Nero Davila, like something similar with with the same kind of consistency as far as you know, the tannins and, and the, you know, the um, boldness of the wine would maybe be like a Barolo or Barbaresco. Right, so or even guys, an Alianico. I haven't tried the Nero Davila, but it, it does not taste the same clearly. However, but that's, you know, that's, that's the comparison that we're making. That is the type of wine that this particular wine might soften a little bit and give you a little bit more, you know, pleasant, smooth finish. Mm-hmm. So what do you guys think? What else are you smelling? For me, I get that, that going back to that spicy note, the black pepper, um, yeah. you know, some yeah. reds I think have like green pepper. So, but this is, I get that black pepper too, both in smell and in taste a little bit. Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to not really skip ahead, but I'll tell you guys while we're talking about that, one of my favorite dishes with this are, are spicy Asian foods. So if you had sushi and you wanted like maybe red wine with it instead of the traditional white wine or a plum wine, um, I really enjoy this frappato with it. That's really good. Or even Indian food will go really well with this mm -hmm. because it doesn't linger as long. So, you know, you're not really battling those tastes in your mouth. And if you like red wine, it would be a perfect pairing for this. So just, just to throw my insight in there. You're right. It's mm -hmm. a quicker stop. It is. It is. Yeah. And it's, again, it's, it's another one that we think is a little too easy to drink. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So and then, 
Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Come on. No, I was just going to bring up the temperature part. So that's why I'd sent an email out last night about temperatures of the wine. Because remember, if we were in Italy, many houses would have an actual cellar or a basement type. And that's where most of the wine would be stored and it would be cooler temperatures. But here in Florida, I'm speaking for Florida, you know, where heat and humidity reign supreme, especially in the summer. That's why we want to make sure that we're trying to have wine that's not our room temperature. So we're in, I, you know, getting the ideal taste of the wine. And I think the, because usually sometimes people think of red wine, they're like, oh, wait, red wine shouldn't be chilled at all. But it's just more Italians, they're not having wine that's from 85 to 90 degrees. Their red wines are usually, you know, 60 degrees and maybe pushing it to 75, 80 you know, is pushing it, definitely. But that's why, you know, I was telling you just to keep in mind that, you know, some of us have a wine refrigerator, but some of us don't. But, you know, just don't have a wine, like if you bought it at the store or even, don't just open it right away because we want to have these flavors, you know, that are perfect. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was a big thing when we, we like I said, we started out in multiple storage units and we, purchased this house here in Virginia um, and it has a giant basement. And that was the most amazing thing for us because we don't have to worry about air conditioning. Now what we have to worry about is it's so hot outside, the duct work is condensing, uh, pushing air through the top part of the house. But you know, that doesn't have anything to do with the wine. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool place. And it's really easy for us to store the wine and not have to worry about it not have to worry about some crazy person coming to the storage unit and leaving the doors open or something like that. Um, and not have to worry about turning everything over every week or so. So um, it's been really convenient for us. What Can else, what do you think about the about food the, here? Uh, the business, Sorry? The, uh, the family and how you found these wines. I'd be interested in the discovery part of it. So it's so it's, it's actually, it's it's really cool. We, we work with some really great people um, that are importers. And our goal when we started this business was to become an importer ourselves. Um, Virginia has some pretty strict laws. And, you know, we're based in Virginia, even though Julie's in Florida. Um, so when it comes to shipping, I know some people weren't able, we weren't able to ship wine to them. I know we weren't able to ship wine to you guys. I'm sorry about that. Um, but, um, I think that you guys hopefully found some really good wines to enjoy tonight. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so, you know, when it comes to that, we have to, we have to spend a year, um, a year, you know, selling wine retail before we can actually become an importer, um, here. So that is, you know, and, and our principle is we are, we are working full-time jobs and stuff like that. This is something that we do in the evenings and the nights, you know, the weekends and stuff. So when it comes to finding the perfect wines, it's usually by recommendation. Um, social media does ironically play a huge role in it because when we see the vineyards and the families, you know, posting, you know, posting about their family and their experience and stuff like that, it means a lot more to us. We've been very fortunate to visit a lot of the vineyards. This vineyard has not been one of them yet, yet. Yes. Um, <laughs> But there's, you know, there's always room for that. I think my personal goal is, you know, when I retire from the car business and, you know, the family businesses that we have here in the in, in Virginia, um, is I want to become, you know, someone who negotiates and who travels around Europe or, you know, South America and and finds these amazing wines and imports them back into the United States. So it's really for me, I and I don't mean to speak for Julie, but I believe it's the same for her. And I know it's the same for my sister. That is our ideal situation, you know, as we, you know, as we get to the point where we start to reach our, you know, middle age is we want to be able to have that security of a business already established um, that we can move forward and, and, and really grow it at that point. And, and many of them oh, drive them sight unseen, right? Oh, no, well, we, yeah, we do a lot of tastings. Um, so we're pretty fortunate. Our, our vendors are pretty cool. They all, not all of them, but three of them own restaurants themselves, the people who actually sell to us, and they stock these wines. So we could either visit their restaurants or they could bring it to us. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. We, we, I think we're pretty fortunate that we don't have a lot of wines that I wouldn't drink on a daily basis. Um, we just can't because we've got real, real jobs to deal with too. So, 
and, of, and many of the wines that we do sell, actually I would say most of them, is that they're coming from small to medium sized vineyards. They're family run usually for Alcesti, for example, it's a third generation family vineyard. Um, I know that it will be become a fourth generation family vineyard. And that's what I think the appeal is because when we think of Italian culture, it's very family oriented. And especially when it comes to wine and you know olive oil or some of the other industries of Italy, keeping it in the family is very important. And you know, keeping going with those different uh, traditions. When I was in Italy, I had visited uh, quite a few wineries in Northern Italy and Central Italy, and they were all family run, family owned, and that's the whole goal is to keep those in the family. So for Alcesti in Sicily, their, their main goal is to promote Sicilian grapes as they have with Sabibo and Frappato, but they also make a wine from the Grillo, and they even make an ancestral method, which means it's a sparkling wine that has yeast still in the wine. So they really try to promote the traditions of Sicily through their wines. And that's, for someone like myself, that's very important to keep those traditions, you know? And then of course, with the Italian seller, we try to, you know, extend that to our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. So are the Italian wines of, impacted by the tariffs, you know, the, the, the EU they, tariff? So they are. So here's, here's the deal with that. If you notice, a lot of our wines have higher alcohol content. So the thing that you have to look at is wines with over a 12% alcohol content are not as impacted as the wines with the lower alcohol content. So it's, it's not as much of the wine itself that is demanding such a higher price right now. It is the actual you know, alcohol content. Um, if it has a higher content, it's considered a liqueur. Um, as a liqueur, it does not have as high of taxes. Um, so that's something that vendors like ourselves do not have to pass along. Uh, the biggest thing right now is, you know, and it's crazy with those micro, microchip shortages, you wouldn't think that would have affected wine. However, the boats that they're coming over in, the pallets and, you know, cases and all this wine that's being shipped over from Italy, um, utilize those same chips. Um, so what was taking, and this is the excuse that, you know, we're getting and that everybody's getting, what was taking maybe two weeks, you know, to leave Sicily and get to the United States is now taking close to three or four months. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so us getting wine as quickly is a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, we're constantly, we order something and then we're constantly, constantly waiting on it. But, you know, I mean, it is, like I said, it is, you know, it is the way that life is right now. Um, but we have some pretty amazing wines. So uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much, I guess. You can always just have a glass of wine. <clears throat> right. Uh, and those ones with, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, because I have this theory. I mean, there are great wines out there and they're probably in the in home country or relatively inexpensive. And, you know, but obviously the travel and the, you know the shipping, et cetera. But then if you had tariffs to it, you know, it just um, and that's honestly, really these are real uh, and, and high quality. So I was wondering how you were doing that if there was you know tariffs involved because it didn't seem to make sense. Uh, so just to give you a little bit more background on our business as well, um, the, the the vendors that we deal with, we don't deal with the mass you know, mass vendors, the ones that have their own, you know, for the most part, their own vineyards and stuff like that in countries. Um, so what we do is we deal with the family vineyards um, through smaller distributors. So they don't have, you know, each of our distributors maybe has, you know, 20 or 30 Italian wines that they deal with. Um, so when it comes to so when it comes to, you know, the wines that they have, they have to be really good at those wines. The, these wines that you'll see that we have are typically not sold in stores. For the most part, they are sold in small restaurants. Um, and they're, they're typically for like, you'll, you'll, you would find this one in a Sicilian restaurant somewhere. You wouldn't find it somewhere that's like a, you know, a Carabas or something like that. Um, you know, so, so we're able to keep the cost down because they're, you know, they are lesser known, uh, but they do have, they do have, you know, that, that connection. 
Um, and plus, you know, restaurants have a little bit different pricing structure as well. So they need to be able to market up significantly more than we do, um, which kind of helps with the, with the whole price point itself. Can I ask one more? I don't yeah. have to take a over. <laughs> but, you know, that concept of, in Europe of, um, you know, classification, like Chianti Classico is, I guess, supposedly has a, um, you know, a quality that you can count on no matter what the brand is, right? And so, so how is, how does that work? And, you know, then the competition of like the pyramid, you know, I, I missed the first, uh, you know, but it's, you know, where, where you can count, you know, like Provence means something or whatever. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, you know, so, so how do you, in that, in that regard, so the Italian government publishes something called a Disciplinare, and that is basically the book that with each wine, it has the rules on how that wine specifically needs to be produced. So each consortium, so they call it, for example, with Chianti Classico, the Consortio di Chianti Classico, they decide themselves, okay, we are a Doc G wine because the Italian government is allowing us to be a Doc G wine. What are the highest standards that will make this a Doc G wine. So the consortio is made up usually of the larger uh, you know, family run vineyards. So when we're talking about Riscoli, we're talking about Monte, um, Montiasco, like the larger families that you know, still have the main vineyards, they all decide and they vote on for Chianti Classico Doc G. They're going to say, okay, this wine will be aged for two years. We're going to use certain barrels, which are usually French oak. We are going to decide on our properties which area really is better for, you know, with the soils, because in Chianti Classico, there are different soils like Galestro and Albaresto, like which ones are better for Chianti Classico. And they all decide and they vote on it. And then the Italian government approves it. And then there's a page in the book for, it's funny, I should have had it up because usually I have it up. Mm -hmm. And I could read the rules of what a Chianti Classico Doc G wine should be. And that's the difference between Chianti Classical Doc G and then there's Chianti Doc G. So some people sometimes will confuse them, but Chianti Classico, the term Classico in itself by the Italian government means it has to be grown in the historical area. So for Chianti Classico, there are villages that, so um, Greve and Chianti, Rada and Chianti, those are the villages that are considered classical. So what that tells you is that if you were to find a wine and you were to look at the label and see a Chianti Classical Doc G wine, you know it's going to be from a certain village, usually the village is noted anyway, and then it will be aged for at least two years, and then you'll know that there are different requirements for the type of oak that it's used, and then how much time it spends in bottle before it even is released commercially. So that's where the pyramid comes in because Doc G is considered the highest standards, but I just call it more the strictest standards. Mm. Whereas when we go to the Doc wines, which, you know, for, because you're not going to ever find a Chianti classical Doc wine, it's not allowed. That's illegal. It's a fraud. I'm sure, you know, you might, someone might try to sell a black market, but it's a fraud. But if it were a Doc wine, which means it's still made from the Sangiovese grape, because Chianti Classico is usually mainly Sangiovese, it will be called something else. It will be called maybe um, like a Toscana doc, or it will be called, you know, with Brunello di Montalcino, which is another Sangiovese based wine, it will be called Rosso di Montalcino. It just means the rules are relaxed more, but the Italian government is very strict about this, which is why even on Doc G bottles, it will usually have a facetta, which is a sticker that will say Doc G on it, or it will say Doc, because they're very, very um, intense about that, even to the point of what you can write on the label. So those are things we can always count on <clears throat> in Italy. Are other countries as strict about wines like Italy is? Well, France has its own classification mm. system as well. So, you know, sometimes there's a rivalry between the French and the Italians. Mm. Gee, yeah. Why would that be? Because especially when it comes to wine, because the French wine scene is, has seen as dominated. And now Italy, even though it has, you know, vineyards from top to bottom, it has over 500 native grapes. 
the Italian wine scene is finally becoming more popular. But yes, some countries and Spain has a classification system as well. But those countries will determine what their pyramids would look like. Oops, excuse me. There's nothing like that in the US, right? I don't believe so for the US. I mean, there's governing councils and stuff like that, but I, it's not it's not the same and it's not the same intensity. Italy, just, I mean, just for reference, Italy has an entire police force dedicated just for Italian wine classifications, just for the classifications. Oh. So they will go into a vineyard and stop production if <laughs> one, yep. one, of the, one of the check marks are not checked off properly. So, right, yeah. and then there'll be another sector that checks the olive oil. Right, and then there's another sector that checks your Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. Uh huh. So they're living the life, in my <laughs> opinion. But Italy takes its exports very seriously because the Made in Italy brand is very important. So some parts of Italy can be rather, you know, <laughs> there are words for that. But when it comes to their products and their foods and their wines. They take that very seriously. The next time in August, I'll have I'll make sure that I have the disciplinare up and I'll read you those for those two wines <laughs> because it's very interesting. Yeah. It's like it's like its little checklist and rubric. That's really cool. I actually didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't actually like this at the beginning when I was like my first few sips, but the more I'm drinking it, I, I definitely like it more. And I'm like, eating it with like little bits of dark chocolate too. Yeah. And it's, it's really good. I like it. I like it way more than I did at the beginning. Yeah. Sounds like Danielle needs some Janduya chocolate. <laughs> mm. I had actually, so a couple Sundays ago, I had some friends over and I didn't have any food in my house except for some frozen Eggo waffles and Nutella. <laughs> And we drank this wine and enjoyed several toasted uh, Eggo waffles with Nutella on top. So just so you know, that's a great pairing right there, guys. Very, very gourmet. Very gourmet. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? I had, I guess, I, I feel like this is a silly question, but it might not be. Um, I guess when we go shopping to the store and we pick up something, my husband and I are big fans of Cab. And we hear all the time here, Cabernet, Merlot, Chardonnay, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Noir. So we kind of probably stray away from the Italian wine section just because we don't know that much about it. So Juan, thank you so much um, for doing this. Other than whenever I dine out somewhere with Julie and she tells me about <laughs> Doc G, um, I don't really know much about Italian wine. So I guess some of these, as we were conversing, you know, via text, that the the white tastes like a Pinot Grigio. This is a little bit like a cab. Can you explain the difference, I guess, between those and those terms that maybe we're more familiar with here, um, like cab, Merlot, those com more common phrases, and then, I guess, go into, you know, if I wanted to go to Publix and get a nice Italian wine like this, what to look for, maybe, so that I don't just go to the Cabernet section and I, you know, go to the other side of the aisle within Publix and, and help me out a little bit. <laughs> well, first off, I'll let, I'll let Julie answer this question, but you can order as much wine from the Italian seller as you'd like, and we can create custom packages for you. So you don't even have to worry about going. Oh, to I know. <laughs> uh, Perfect. Uh, um, but yeah, you know, as far as the, you know, the wines themselves, there are some, some things that you guys can tell. And I think um, we did have a label in a previous presentation and we'll make sure and send you guys, once we do our Abruzzo lesson, we'll send you guys the entire compilation of everything. So as long as we have everybody's email address, we'll make sure and send that out to you guys. Uh, but Julie, I'll defer so, to you. Okay, so Amy was mentioning some actually popular international grapes. So when I'm referring to them as international grapes in the Italian scene, that means they're grapes that are usually not native to Italy. So we're thinking of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc. We're thinking, it's interesting, Pinot Grigio in itself is not native to Italy. That's a grape that actually came from Germany and Austria. So these are grapes that are more international. So they'll pop up in French wines. They even, they're grown in New Zealand. They're grown in Australia, South Africa even. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chardonnay, of course, we're thinking California. So that's why you're probably more familiar with them. Whereas the Italian wines are more 
and they tend to be just like I was talking about this vineyard specifically, they avoid, I don't want to say avoid, but you know, they're more in, intent on promoting their native grapes. So, and I'll talk about Publix because I live in Florida and I'm a public shopper and I know that aisle very well. You know, so that's how I used to quiz myself before I took my exam. And what's interesting is that Publix has, you know, quite an array, but of course, any grocery store, any wine store will always have a few staples. What will they have? They'll have Chianti Classico, which, you know, that's connected to Chianti Classico is Sangiovese, which is a grape that's known to the Toscana region. They'll have Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio is, it's considered traditional to Northeastern Italy, but it's, and it's an international grape. And they'll also have Montepulciano di Abruzzo, yeah. which is considered the gateway grape for Italian wine because it's not, it's a little different from Chianti Classico. It's a little more fuller bodied, mm -hmm. whereas Chianti Classico sometimes is more considered medium bodied. So those are wines that you could find at any store. Where Publix is interesting as well is that they'll have, um, depending on where your Publix is located, they tend to know their audience very well. And they'll start to, some public stores will have an Emerone della Val Policella, which is a, a wine from Veneto. And then they'll have even, some will have a Barbaresco wine. Mm -hmm. So these are wines that it's not maybe the wine itself, it's maybe more, we're not familiar with the grapes. So most people haven't heard of a Nebbiolo grape unless they've been Nebbiolo drinkers of Barolo or Barbaresco. And then Emerone, which is, you know, has quite a punch to it, 14% alcohol. That's, you know, typical of the, the Venetian grapes of Corvino, Rondinella, Corvinone. So it's more about familiarizing ourselves with the grapes. So for example, Sangiovese is the most widely planted grape in Italy. It's found of the 21 regions. It's usually found in about 16 of those regions. Then the Montepulciano grape is the second most widely planted red grape. And then when we're talking white grapes, actually what's interesting is a Sicilian grape called Catarato, which is a different native grape. That's one of the more popular ones because that grape is grown all over the island of Sicily. And when we think of Italy in itself and migration, Sicily, Catarato, has then migrated into Calabria, which we know, I know there's not a map here, but Calabria is the next region where the toe of Italy is. Yeah. So then it's Calabria, and then it's made its way into Basilicata, which is where the arch is, and then it's made its way even north of Calabria into Campania. So these grapes, I call them their immigrant stories as well, just like Italians had immigrated to the United States, because these grapes are found you know, they're usually, when I was studying even, I knew that they would be in certain areas. So it's just more familiarizing ourselves with them. But Sangiovese is usually the most popular one. Archiantes, Brunello, et cetera. So you mentioned at one time that you, you've been leading tours in Italy. And I know this may not be the best time, but what, what's a description of a tour? We're kind of uh, fascinated and interested in the idea of, of uh, food and, and drink. So what, what, what would you be doing under better circumstances? Well, okay. so, so that's how we actually, so we started off and you can definitely, if you, if you go to our website, The Italian Tour, not the Italian seller, but the Italian tour. You can check that out too. I think we have some sample itineraries on there. Um, that's really how we started off in the wine business is, you know, we, everybody kept asking us because we would go to Italy two and three times a year. We were very fortunate to be able to do so, but we'd go to Italy two and three times a year and everybody would be like, oh, so you're in Italy. You know, what did you do? What did you see? Where did you stay? And all this other stuff. And we ended up being so controlling that we would plan their trip for them. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is kind of true about the both of us, Julie and I. Um, so, so we were thinking about it one day and I, I think a friend had said something to me and, and I was talking to Julie, she was in Trieste in Italy. And, um, and I said, hey, listen, why don't we start a travel agency? You know, somebody had said it should be a good tax break for us, but I think why not go 100%? So we started the travel agency. And of course, you know, 2019, we started tra planning travel. We had several tours booked and all of a sudden everything just crashed with COVID. 
Um, and, and the worst part about it is everything that we did, we had these real connections with people that we had met and made friends with along the way. And, you know, they had small travel agencies in the different regions. Um, in Italy, it's very specific about what you can do and where you can tour and, who, you know, who you have to be and what licenses you have to have. Um, you know, just like with the wine, it's, it's, it's extremely specific. So what we did was, you know, we, we leveraged those friendships and those connections and we started planning travel for people. We got a couple trips down and then COVID hit. Um, and then of course they started having problems. They weren't able to go out at all. They weren't able to sell their goods at all. Mm -hmm. So they started having problems. And I told Julie and my sister, I said, listen, we've got to do something to help these people. So, you know, there's some of our wines and I can, you know, I can shoot you an email with a couple of those wines as well, um, are from vineyards that we have visited and we know the, you know, the producers of this wine. We've walked on the soil. We have, you know, told them, hey, we want to come back and, you know, help you pick the grapes next time it's time for harvest. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden, you know, the world changed and we weren't able to do so. Um, so, so yeah, so we've really kind of, We've kind of, you know, merged into two different directions. We've got our, our you know, our wine that we do. And then we also um, help plan travel. We don't do it as in detail as we did before. We just help with logistics and planning and, you know, putting the connections together. Um, but when it comes to, you know, tours and stuff like that, we've kind of, you know, taken that down a notch just because, you know, we were burned a little bit, you know, when it came to, you know, we, we, we made sure that our customers were refunded 100%, you know, after COVID happened. We, you know, even if we weren't able to recoup the money and stuff like that, we, we weren't going to let them, you know, hang out there and, and not be able to travel to Italy. Um, the irony there is that a lot of them have come back and decided they wanted to plan another trip now. So, um, <laughs> so it's a little bit different, but yeah, so, so when it comes to travel now, we're planning a trip, um, you know, a, a trip in, in the summertime. Um, in June of next year. Um, we're going to go over and visit and see how things are in October. And then we'll talk about opening things up. So if you're interested um, in joining us, you're more than welcome. All you have to do is just shoot me an email. Uh, we don't live at five-star hotels or anything like that. So if that's what you're expecting, um, you know, we, we stay at nice places, family run and owned places. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of what you get with us. So, and we were happy to plan the other trips if you wanted something a little bit more luxurious. Yes, and I was just there and it was like I had said before, it was a different experience than the times that I had traveled before. You know, rules are changing quickly. I had happened to visit it, I think right at the prime time as things had been opening up again. My, sec my first day there, they had just finally opened up restaurants for indoor service. I could go up to the counter for my espresso, my cappuccino. That hadn't been allowed for almost, you know, over a year. Yeah. And so that's why I said when I had visited certain, you know, usual tourist spots, it was empty. Like I had Rome to myself one morning. But that's, it's things are changing. So that's why 2021 is just really to see how things are opening up, you know, what's really going on. Um, you know, Italian tourism, that's a huge part of their economy. And of course, they want Americans to come back. But, you know, as an agency, we want to make sure that people are able to go back safely. And, um, you know, with fewer intrusion intrusions. I was so happy to see that the large um, cruise ships can't go into Venice anymore. Yes. I, and that's something that was just that just happened as well. Yeah, you know, and then, of course, we were talking about Italy and France and their rivalry earlier. An Italian cruise ship commander, because Italy won again the Euro Cup, um, was docking at one of the ports in France and was, like, using the horn to honk one of the Italian soccer songs just to uh, tease the French. Oh, my God. Got a little chuckle at that. But that's what I mean. So imagine the people who had cruise itineraries thinking they could be going to Venice. Yeah. So it's just, it, things are just quickly changing. Even I had some trepidation that while I was there, could there be another shutdown? Could a zone, because zones, there were, every region had a color assigned to it. And again, I happened to land when everything was a white zone, which meant fewer restrictions, just masks. But now they're saying by next week, there could be a yellow zone again, which means restaurants have to be only outdoor service closing the inside of the coffee bars again. 
-hmm. So let's just hope. We'll see what happens. But I was glad I was able to go. That's awesome. Very jealous. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? No. Really no. good. Thank you. Um, just so you guys know, so we did we did add a little package online. Sorry, was that? Sorry. Oh, um, so we did add a little package online. If you go back to the Stetson site and you did enjoy this one, you guys are welcome to buy two more bottles of the Zabibo and two more bottles of Perpato. And we actually, we so in our location in Virginia, we actually house a candle maker and she's pretty phenomenal. Um, Julie, my sister, Lindsay, and I, Lindsay did not go to Stetson, by the way. She went to Queens University in Charlotte. Um, I don't know why, but um, she, she only came down to visit twice too. So if there's any <laughs> presentation there, it's not for me. Um, but yeah, so, so um, but we, we worked together and we kind of went by, you know, the smells and the feelings that we have in Italy. And um, she actually, took all of our suggestions and made three amazing candles. Um, so you guys would get four more bottles of wine and then two of those candles. Um, so Julie has the candles there and it has like our experience and a little postcard and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys are welcome to reach out anytime. Um, you can just email or call us and we will uh, be happy to help make suggestions for wine. Um, if you guys notice, feel free to use the Hatter um, code on our website anytime, um, cause that's free shipping for you guys. Um, and then we can always create custom packages too. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, down here at the bottom, you'll notice these are the places that we ship to. Um, and if you guys are thinking about like, you know, gifts or something like that in the future, we can do that as well. Christmas is coming around the corner. Um, and then if you guys wanted wine by the next event, if you needed more wine, if you decided to drink the other two bottles before we went over it with you, um, you just have to get that order in by August 5th. Um, and we'll take care of that for you as well. So, but we really appreciate you guys. And we really appreciate Stetson for supporting us so much. Um, Amy and Alex over at the alumni group have been absolutely phenomenal to work with. They were friends before, but they, I mean, they just are so easy to work with. So we really appreciate them for putting this on. We appreciate all of you guys for being so supportive to us. Thank you so much. Grazie mille. Grazie.